here on the East Coast, one o'clock. Um, and we are ready to get going with our Stroud Water webinar. Um, first, I wanted to let you know that yes, we will be sending the slides and the audio after the webinar that will come to you tomorrow morning. Um, I wanted to start with just a little bit of background around Stroud Water Associates. We are a leading national healthcare consulting firm serving healthcare clients exclusively. We focus on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our perspective offers the highest value. We're proud of our 34-year history with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. We have offices in Portland, Maine, Atlanta, and Nashville. Um, today, you are hearing from people in North Carolina, Maine, and New Hampshire. Moving on to today's presenters in our Portland, Maine office, Jeffrey Summer is our firm's managing director. He was previously the leader of our affiliations and partnerships and capital planning and access service lines. For more than 25 years, he's focused on assisting clients with strategic initiatives, including planning and executing major capital projects, analyzing strategic options, crafting innovative affiliations, and executing business development opportunities. Beside Jeff today in our Portland office, Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak to any other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready to begin the presentation, pro welcome to the web. Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak to any other organizer and operations. He is part of Stroudwater's rural practice. John Bain in New Hampshire leads Stroudwater's revenue cycle practice. Stroudwater Revenue Cycle Solutions. He has more than 20 years of experience in healthcare financial management and consulting, and his focus includes charge master auditing, revenue cycle initiatives, and hospital and physician practice management. With that, we will turn it over to Jeff Summer, our managing director, to start today's presentation. Jeff? Thank you so much, Kimberly, and, and thank you all for spending some time out of, out of your day with us. Um, I think we have a very good uh, agenda uh, today to share with you. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on some national trends to orient us, provide context. Then we're going to do a high-level just overview of what Stroudwater has developed as, as our operational toolbox in terms of how we approach addressing some of the performance improvement uh, uh, opportunities that exist with our clients. Uh, and then specifically, um, uh, Jonathan Pattenberg is going to walk you through the work that he's been doing with a myriad clients around the country on clinic designations and how those can help unlock um, performance improvement and, and incremental revenue opportunity. Then John Bain is going to walk you through uh, the work that he's been doing with Stradwater Revenue Cycle Solutions um, around the country on behalf of clients and share some of the compelling um, work and, and results that he's uh, been able to um, deliver for clients. Um, Briefly, I'm sure all of you are aware about the, the myriad headwinds that providers face in the current environment. Um, we certainly see these play out so that they're uh, constantly undermining the good work that management teams are doing to improve performance. And at the same time, some of the underpinnings uh, are eroding. And three here that we've highlighted, uh, the impact of high deductible health plans, um, you know, even in states that have expanded Medicaid, Within a relatively short period of time, you see the reduction in self-pay or bad debt start to creep up back to uh, 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 historic levels and, and on that path because of the hollowing out of traditional uh, commercial insurance. Market consolidation and new entrants uh, in many markets are a top concern. And then lastly, consumerism, where increasingly patients have very high expectations about access, about customer service. Uh, and also about transparency and pricing and the desire to price shop. All of those put a great deal of pressure on our clients nationally. Many of you doubtless have seen that. Even with all those headwinds, underpinning that is, is an equally challenging or perhaps one of the greatest challenges that our clients face, which is the erosion of Medicare margin, margins over time. And you can see here how those margins are um, 
uh, trending negative and, and are projected to continue so through 2019. The um, top line there, the gray, is, is for profits. And then you see um, all hospitals as blue, um, um, the line shows there. Um, Moody's, not surprisingly, uh, the rating agencies have looked at the outlook for not for profit healthcare um, and hospitals and have a negative outlook and pointing to erosions in cash flow, um, increasing expenses and bad debt, um, I, as I mentioned previously, increasing. The end result of this is um, hospital closures. Clearly there's been an epidemic um, and actually the challenge or the crisis is even greater than this because this, this map does not show all of those organizations that have filed for bankruptcy and may reopen or reorganize, but have a, a reduced footprint and reduced capabilities going forward and certainly have um, continuing uh, uh, operational challenges as well. So a, a host of, of, of issues confronting healthcare. And I wanted to leave you with one, one slide that really speaks to, this isn't just about how it impacts us as healthcare providers or advisors to healthcare providers. Uh, it's important to remember that ultimately the community <coughs> we serve uh, bear the brunt of uh, these challenges. And there's some recent research that's come out um, looking at closures in California and they compared mortality rates um, in hospital service areas where they had a closure versus those they didn't. And they found a statistically significant and, more, and, and um, material uh, increase in mortality um, in those service areas where there had been closures. So, at the end of the day, we all want to do what's best for our organizations and also the communities. And the work we're doing is vitally important to them. So uh, we should never lose sight of that. Um, Kimberly, do you want to uh, hit this, this first polling question? Sure. Let me launch this poll and everyone can react to it. Come back to life a little bit from your lunch or your late coffee. Um, what best describes your organization? Um, healthy, uh, compromised, stressed, or distressed? And watching the results come in will give people a little bit of time. Right now, it looks like 50% are saying compromised and about 30% are saying healthy. All right, I'm going to close out of this. It looks like the majority have voted. I'm going to close this and uh, share the results. So it looks like, look, yeah, compromise coming in um, at almost 50% of the responses. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, and Jonathan is going to... Um, lead us through, well, excuse me, before we do that, I apologize. I just wanted to share a, a little bit of perspective on how we think about um, operational improvement and strategic risk. And um, we, we look at, at the components of this as having four primary vectors. There's a set of operating issues, obviously a set of financial issues, and then we have two vectors, uh, value and market-driven ones. Um, the two that we're focusing on today in terms of tools or uh, the toolkit um, really relate to operating considerations. And as I mentioned previously, revenue cycle and coding being uh, something that John Bain is going to talk to you about. And then practice and clinic designations is really um, uh, John, Jonathan Pattenberg has been doing some, some very innovative work um, with clients nationally in that space. The key point of this slide um, that I would leave you is there are a lot of potential tools available to organizations to um, improve their operating results and um, get back to a healthy from a compromised or healthy from a stressed uh, position. And so the, the earlier you take action, the less uh, of a challenge you'll face um, to get back to um, where you'd like to be in terms of operating results. Take it away, Jonathan. Thank you, Jeff. So as Jeff had mentioned, uh, we're going to focus a little bit of our time on clinic designations today. 
And what I really want to highlight with regard to these different strategies is these strategies are something that can work for independent hospitals um, around the $10 million critical access hospital range, all the way up to multi-billion dollar multi-hospital institutions. And again, it's often how we decide to cater those different strategies and how we want to apply those going forward to really look at how we can realize those different opportunities and what type of revenue can materialize from based on those different strategies. This is something that we're starting to see systems uh, do across the country. And when we think about the perspective as to why, Medicare and other payers have continued to look at ways to either slow down expense increases or reimbursement increases or look at different ways as to how they can actually cut those reimbursements going forward. So we're continuing to see healthcare entities with expenses increasing at a greater rate than what reimbursement is going forward. A lot of these strategies that we're gonna discuss in this section really tie back as to how we can leverage rural health providers and how we can look at starting to tap into some of those programs to really leverage those reimbursement advantages. And again, we're not gonna get into a lot of the regulatory stuff today. We're really gonna focus at a high level on some of those different opportunities on how we can leverage those going forward. So when we look up on the screen, we can really see there's four main opportunities we're gonna look at. And again, these aren't every opportunity that you can take advantage of. These are just some of the opportunities that most of the systems are starting to look at. And we wanted to group them together based on which ones could really materialize and improve those reimbursements going forward. The first one really looks at how can we convert any eligible practice that we currently own and what are alternative designations that we can look at going forward. So maybe right now we have a provider-based clinic which is operating as a department of the hospital and maybe we wanna look at converting that to a rural health clinic. Or maybe we have some freestanding clinics that are aligned under a different part of our hospital and we wanted to look at converting those to provider-based rural health clinics. Again, it's really looking at the complement of those designations and saying, how can we look at those going forward? The next opportunity really looks at, from a system perspective, how can we realign practices within the system? So maybe we have a physician group that's offer, operating a bunch of freestanding health centers under one wing of the hospital system. We want to look at how can we realign and redesignate those practices? Maybe we want to realign them under some critical access hospitals or under a sole community hospital that allows us to yield higher reimbursement advantages than based on that current reimbursement designation. The next one looks at really how can we integrate some of our specialty providers. So when we look across the healthcare landscape, specialty providers have often operated differently or in different areas than our primary care practices. As we start to look at our rural communities and we start to expand specialty services into those communities, how can we look at integrating those within rural health clinics or within other practices to really yield some of those reimbursement advantages? Again, it's, it's leveraging the program within the confines of those designation requirements to say, what can we do to yield us some higher reimbursement? The last opportunity really looks at how can we potentially acquire different independent practices. Maybe there's an independent practice in our town that's operating as a freestanding clinic. As we start to look at moving more towards population-based reimbursement and more towards accountable care organizations, how can we partner or how can we work with those independent practices? So this opportunity will really look at the acquisition of those practices to say, okay, based on those practices getting a fee schedule reimbursement now, if we were to acquire those practices and operate them under the umbrella of the hospital, what could that do in the way of reimbursements, whether it's 340B or the ability to get a facility fee reimbursement? So those are really the four different strategies we're gonna talk about today. But first, what I wanted to talk about is each of the different designations has different reimbursement advantages and different abilities to secure additional funding sources. I'm not gonna go into much detail in these different areas. I'll first explain the, the acronyms that we see listed at the top. The first one is an FQHC, a Federally Qualified Health Center. The second is a provider-based clinic. And the purposes of putting this under a critical access hospital is to really maintain that rural focus. Next is a provider-based rural health clinic. And this is a clinic that's aligned under a hospital with fewer than 50 beds. So whether that's a critical access hospital, a sole community hospital designation, or a short-term acute care hospital designation, it's really looking at whether you're aligned under a hospital with fewer than 50 beds. 
And that last is the FSHC, a freestanding health center. Now, what I really want to highlight here is just that you can notice that some of them are green and some of them are orange. The green ones are those ones that actually can realize those additional benefits, whereas the orange ones are the ones that do not realize that benefit. So what I want to highlight on this slide is really start by saying that if we look all the way to the right, the FSHC, I generally always say that this is the worst of the worst. If you can be anything but a freestanding health center, you generally want to try to be that. This often leads to the lowest reimbursement. You cannot get a facility fee component. You can't qualify for 340B or any of those other advantages from a program perspective. So again, it, you really want to be anything but a freestanding health center. What I'll do quickly is go down the rows and just explain the differences between those reimbursements. The first is a 330 grant. This is something that's only available to your FQHCs. And really what your 330 grant is, is it provides some additional funding due to the fact that your FQHCs are targeting a disparate population, whether it's a low income or underserved or certain outcomes. They're targeting that population and providing services to that population. So they have the ability to go in for. Now, again, this doesn't guarantee you're going to get that 330 funding, but an FQHC has that ability to try to go in for that grant funding to help subsidize some of the cost of providing services to that disparate population. The 340B program, what this looks at is it's a program that allows you to get we'll call it a rebate for drug prescriptions filled and written out of your clinic. So your FQHC, by regulatory rules, automatically qualifies for that 340B program. If you are operating under a critical access hospital, again, you automatically qualify for that 340B program. When looking at a sole community hospital or a PPS hospital, now those hospitals can qualify to participate in the 340B program. However, those hospitals have to have an adequate dish percentage, a disproportionate share hospital percentage to end up qualifying for that 340B program. If you're a sole community hospital, that's 8%. If you are a regular PPS hospital, that's 11.75. But again, just being one of those designations does not automatically qualify you for those programs, as does the FQHC or a critical access hospital. The uncapped technical charge. Now, what I consider uncapped technical charge is anything that is greater than those HOPD or OPPS um, rates. So you get that APC payment if you are a part of a PPS hospital. A critical access hospital, because you're getting a cost-based rate, where ultimately your cost drives your reimbursement, that is what we consider that uncapped technical charge. So you can have an uncapped technical charge at $50, you can have one up at $150. That rate varies ultimately based on the cost within your hospital. Method two billing is something only available to your critical access hospital. So you can notice that that PBC and the second column under your critical access hospital is the only one that is green. What method two is a program that's available to your critical access hospitals where Medicare pretty much said, if you decide or elect to consolidate claims and submit to us a single claim that includes both the technical and the professional, we will give you an enhanced reimbursement on the fee schedule side. So again, this is a way that Medicare is looking at reducing some of the administrative exposure and cost by saying, let's consolidate some of those claims and actually provide a benefit to do that. When we look at tort reform, now tort reform is something where you can get malpractice savings. That is something only available to your FQHCs. So because there's that limitation on the exposure of your FQHCs from a malpractice perspective, the insurance companies have decided to say, okay, we will give you some savings since there's ultimately a limit to the exposure. You can get a reduction in your malpractice cost. The last one is your enhanced PPS. And similar to your uncapped technical, what I consider enhanced PPS is any reimbursement which is greater than your Medicare fee schedule. So your FQHCs, because they're getting an all-inclusive rate, and right now it's around $165 and it's geographically adjusted, that rate is in excess of what you would be able to get on a straight fee schedule reimbursement from the physician fee schedule. Your critical access hospitals can qualify for enhanced PPS reimbursement. However, they can only qualify if you participate in the Method 2 program. So if a critical access hospital elects not to participate in Method 2, 
On the professional side, they would get straight pro fee reimbursement. The last one that I want to focus on is your provider-based rural health clinic. Now, the big difference between a rural health clinic and a provider-based clinic from a provider-based perspective is on the rural health clinic side, when you're determining that fully allocated cost-based rate, you leave in your physician costs to determine that cost-based rate. When you have that standard provider-based clinic, you have to carve out that physician cost and bill the pro fees for that cost or to cover that cost. So your provider-based rural health clinic can get an uncapped professional rate because when you're factoring the cost of those providers, many times in rural communities, we have not optimized or created the efficiencies just because we have limitations to the number of patients often to where we can really maximize the number of patients seen within a day. So we've seen those rates as high as $200, $300 per visit because you're using a fully cost-based factor to determine what that reimbursement rate is. Now, when looking at the different factors, I always generally like to say that your provider-based clinic is one that can allow you to yield the highest returns because, again, you're not limited by volume. So as you carve out that cost from a physician perspective, if you have a doctor that can see 5,000 patients a year, you can bill 5,000 visits at the pro fee schedule, which can often cover the cost of that physician. Your rural health clinic allows you to diversify your risk the most. As your visits go down, your rate can go up. As your cost goes up, your rate can go up. So it allows you to blend some of those cost increases across all of the visits. Now, again, your rural health clinic, I don't want to make it seem like it's perfect for everybody because you do have those productivity thresholds. So again, as you're looking at that rural health clinic, you do have to see a certain number of patients to qualify for that maximum reimbursement rate. If you don't reach, if you don't hit that rate, you can see a reduction in some of your reimbursement. I know that was a lot of information in a minute um, or a couple minutes. What I really want to focus on now is just looking at some of those different opportunities. So what the first slide ends up looking at, and again, this is the practice conversion. In this scenario, we worked with a system that was currently in excess of 50 beds, and they were operating some provider-based clinics. So what we wanted to look at was if we were to convert all of those practices to provider-based rural health clinics, we could see in that scenario two, with a hospital of greater than 50 beds, and then scenario three looks at a hospital of fewer than 50 beds. If they were to convert from those provider-based clinics and keep their current bed count, which was in excess of 50, they would have actually lost about $1.7 million in reimbursement. And the reason for that is because if you have greater than 50 beds, you get a capped reimbursement rate as a part of the rural health clinic program. Right now, I believe it's $84.70 in 2019. Now, the interesting thing is if this hospital were to drop their bed count to fewer than 50, they would have gotten uncapped cost-based reimbursement on those practices. So we can see there the Delta was $1.1 million more in reimbursement that they would have received if they could have dropped their bed count. Now, the interesting thing with this hospital is, is that their average daily census was about 25. They were operating under the prior model where they used to be a 75 bed facility and because they had those beds, they continued to operate as a 75 bed facility. If they had gotten rid of those beds and dropped down to 49 beds, they would have been able to receive that reimbursement advantage. So again, it's looking at operational abilities and what we truly need and not just saying, okay, we used to be a 75 bed facility, let's remain being a 75 bed facility. Let's look at all those strategies going forward and how can we change that to really optimize reimbursement and leverage some of these programs. The next one we're looking at is practice realignment. So under the practice realignment, this usually approaches from a system perspective. So if you think of the older model, generally you would have a physician group that was a wholly owned subsidiary of a system, and then you'd have all your hospitals that would actually operate in the system as other wholly owned subsidiaries. What this looked at was saying, okay, if we were to redesignate and realign those practices throughout the system, what type of reimbursement advantage would that give us going forward? So scenario one really looked at the status quo. What were we receiving in reimbursements currently? Scenario two said, okay, if we were to realign all of those practices as provider-based rural health clinics under a hospital that was greater than 25 beds or, and fewer than 50, 
what would that reimbursement be? So again, you'd still get that uncapped cost-based reimbursement, but it's not under a critical access hospital. Scenario, the last scenario looked at if you are a provider-based rural health clinic under a critical access hospital, so again, you'd still get that uncapped cost-based reimbursement, but you'd also be able to get 340B, what would that do to the reimbursement? So we can see that in scenario one, they were getting about $8.2 million a year. Both scenario twos, whether it's under a hospital with fewer than 50 beds as a sole community or the critical access hospital, would have yielded considerable advantages in reimbursement. One was about a $5.3 million gain. The other one was about a $7.1 million gain. The big difference between the two is, is that the one that had greater than 25 beds, the non-critical access hospital, did not qualify for 340B. So we can see that that 340B benefit was about $3.6 million of the benefit. So again, it's looking at all of these strategies and saying, which ones do we qualify and comparing the benefits of each scenario and each of those reimbursement and revenue opportunities and looking at the total impact to reimbursements and revenue and not only looking at a single program. If we were to only look at a single program, we may have done it under a hospital of fewer than 50 beds, but not the critical access hospital because it would have yielded the highest gain from a reimbursement perspective, but we would not have been able to yield the returns from the 340B. So again, you wanna look at all of those opportunities across the board and not look at them independently from one another. <clears throat> Opportunity three was a single hospital that really wanted to look at integrating specialty providers within a rural health clinic. Now, first, what I wanna start by saying is to do this, if you operate a rural health clinic, 51% of the services do have to be primary care in nature. So you cannot set up a primary care uh, advanced practice provider and integrate them within a 20 person orthopedic group and say, okay, well, we have it within a primary care practice they will look at the services provided within that clinic to ensure that you do meet that 51% threshold. But for the clinics up here, they were operating a provider-based specialty practice and a provider-based rural health clinic. So when we look at the reimbursements here, we can see that they were doing pretty well from that perspective. The specialty practice was getting about $217 a visit. Again, they were getting cost-based on the facility side and they were billing the pro fee on the other side. And then we had a provider-based rural health clinic that was getting about $174 a visit. When we ended up combining those two and looking at a single provider-based rural health clinic that both integrated specialty and primary care, the increase on reimbursements was about a half million dollars. Now I realize that a half million dollars doesn't look as great as $7 million, but honestly, any type of reimbursement advantage in today's times, I think we should definitely look at. So this one, all they had to do was integrate that rural health clinic and specialty practice. This didn't require them moving the specialty practice. They were actually located in the same area. They were just carving out on the cost report how they were reporting and accounting and billing for those practices. So this is something where they were able to integrate those practices going forward. As we look at other practices, I don't wanna make it seem like you may not have to move a facility or do some actual things from a facility perspective. There are many other things that you would have to take into account. Again, we're just highlighting the benefit, but it's not an all-encompassing scenario. There are other things we need to take into consideration. <laughs> the last opportunity we're gonna talk about was another hospital that was within a system. And what this hospital wanted to look at was there was an independent practice in their town that they wanted to look at acquiring. So that independent practice was getting about $97 a visit and we look at the critical access hospitals reimbursements there. So when we end up looking forward by acquiring that independent practice and adding it onto the cost report of that critical access hospital, we wanted to look at what the advantages would be from a reimbursement perspective. So again, as an independent practice, you're only getting that pro fee revenue. Adding it onto the critical access hospital, you're now getting that cost-based reimbursement rate. And you could also qualify for the 340B for that program. So by them acquiring this practice was about a $400,000 gain from the 340B program and the reimbursement advantages to that clinic by adding in and getting a fully cost-based rate. So I know now I think Kimberly is going to ask another poll question on some of the opportunities and then we'll really wrap up on some of the key takeaways from this. All right, um, let me put the poll out live here. 
have you implemented any of the following strategies that Jonathan just covered? Um, converting existing practices, realigning practices within the system, specialty integration, practice acquisition, or none of the above? And you can answer as many as you like for this one. Looks like about 50% are coming in that they have not taken advantage of any of these opportunities. About 30% are saying, yes, they have converted existing practices. Give people a little bit of time to wake up their digits. All right, I'm gonna close out in just three, two, one and share with everybody. Okay, so um, we're showing uh, the leading is 37% have converted existing practices, and the lowest is number two, realigning practices within a system. Thank you, Kimberly. And, and, and what the results are reflecting up there is often what we're seeing across the country. Um, some of these strategies are popping up more in rural. Um, I would say that when we look from a system perspective, our systems have often not looked at how to truly leverage um, rural going forward or really looking at it from a current perspective. It, it's definitely an opportunity that we should look at going forward. It's yielded significant gains for some systems or some hospitals. We can look at some of the numbers there that show the advantages from a reimbursement perspective. But again, it's, it's, even if we've implemented some of those strategies, it's really looking at the complement of all of those strategies. We only highlighted four different opportunities. Um, if I were to highlight all the opportunities, it would probably be a three-day webinar and dissertation on really how we can yield those gains looking going forward. So again, what we want to look at is really saying, how can we look at all of those designations? How can we truly start to leverage our rural providers and one of the things I really want to close on as we, uh, before we go over to our next section is saying, you know, this is really a way that the purpose of these programs, whether it's your rural health clinic or FQHC, is really to expand service delivery within our rural communities and also to ensure that we can continue to provide care to those within disparate populations. So again, what we want to do is we want to continue to leverage these designations and these opportunities uh, for, for a long time, rural and primary care has kind of been seen as a lost leader in different areas. We really want to look at leveraging these strategies going forward to say, how can we provide care within our communities and how can we continue to expand access to care within those communities to really ensure that we're providing care to patients that need those level of services. So now what I want to do is I'm going to turn it over to um, John Bain, who is going to take us through our next section. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I, I really enjoy going uh, after uh, Jonathan in these presentations because when you start talking about some of these these issues that he's bringing up, there's um, really you know, an intention to choose the right option to benefit the financial viability of the organization. And none of these things are without complexity. And when you start going through, people finally make the decision to, to do the provider base or the RHC or whatever it might be. Then the next step becomes part of the revenue cycle. How do we actually operationalize that? How do I make sure that we go through and allow the ability to, uh, to take the benefits that are described and allow those things to go through the process and make sure that your charge master, your billing system, your pricing is set up right. And generally, we get a lot of calls uh, specifically around that. So I think Jonathan does a, um, it's a terrific job in just laying out the options because I think that's part of the, the, the biggest process is understanding and being very intentional about where you're needing to go and then marshalling the resources behind you to be able to make sure that you can operationalize those things. Um, and just as an aside, I'm having a little difficulty moving. So if someone could just move to the next slide, that would be tremendous. Thank you. So what I figured we'd do today is uh, walk through and just try to frame the revenue cycle a little bit and use some of our experiences 
in the marketplace right now to allow you to sit back and look in and allow yourself to either validate some of the things that you're doing uh, in comparison to what other um, institutions are doing across the country or look at it in a, maybe a new perspective and be a little bit more entrepreneurial about things and say, hey, you know, maybe if we did X or Y or Z, we might be able to take some of the, the benefits that are, that are out there. You know, so one of the things that we get a lot of calls on routinely are, are people just calling us up and saying, hey, we've got a problem with our revenue cycle. So generally what happens, and you guys all know this, you know, as CEOs and CFOs, there's usually this long deli line outside your uh, office with people just taking um, uh, numbers to come in and tell you all the issues that they've got. The most problem that we end up hearing is that people, you know, say that there's everything wrong and they're not necessarily specific. You know, they'll come to us and say, we've got a business office issue or we've got a revenue cycle staffing issue um, or, you know, we've got no accountability in our organization or, you know, there's a lack of focus on where we need to go. The, the reality is that we just have, um, oops, hold on one second, something seems to be happening here. Yeah, uh, uh, John Benson is uh, our IT director is on it. Uh, just I'm going to go on mute just a second. Okay, no, no worries. I, I'll just I'll, I'll keep going. And and you know, and this is a good example. You know, so when unintended things happen in our operations, you know, do we have the the operational wherewithal to be able to just keep on going? The the biggest thing is is that most hospitals just have a difficult time. Um, uh, really nailing down what the issues are. And what we end up finding is that there's a, a lack of understanding um, of what their revenue cycle is in their organization. So whenever we talk to folks, and, and I would encourage you, whether you have a revenue cycle steering committee or you have uh, groups of departments who get together, uh, to sit down and really work on and define what the revenue cycle means in your organization. For our definition, and the way we've, we've created uh, our revenue cycle service, is that we focus in on the entire revenue cycle. So from everything from that, that uh, pre-authorization, so the, the, the phone call coming in to set things in motion, all the way through uh, the successful uh, customer service um, survey that goes out to the patient. And when we talk to most folks, dependent upon the seat that you sit in, and the perspective that you hold, that ultimately becomes the perception of what the revenue cycle is. So, so for some people, they think it's just the business office. Some think it's just coding. Um, others say that it's everything except for me, right? So what we wanna make sure of, and the success that happens in your organization really depends on getting a solid uh, definition of it. And most importantly, as you start moving forward, utilizing all of the talents within your organization and really establishing a data-driven and quality-focused revenue cycle that is customer-centric. And a lot of things, and, and I think everyone uh, that's in, the, in any type of hospital operations knows, the most emotional aspects of uh, uh, the hospital operation a lot of times resides around revenue cycle. It's a very emotional uh, uh, thing. Uh, a lot of people are very defensive about things. What we have to do is we have to take the emotion out of things. We've got to make it so that we almost have an it is what it is type of environment. And a lot of times when we do that and we want common ground, we focus in on data, we focus in on identifying quality, and we identify on identifying what customer service really needs to be. Usually, the disparate parts of your organization can usually agree on a lot of those things. So now you've got common ground and you can build on that. Most hospitals have difficulty trying to get either the data to work or to, to, to define what quality might mean in your revenue cycle. It is one of the most important pieces of all the engagements and all of the um, projects that we do. It's focusing in on those aspects and making sure that the organization can sustain the, the opportunities going through. Uh, one of the areas that we started to see a great deal and I wanted to share with you because it, it really combines all of the revenue cycle options that are out there, whether it be charge master or pricing or utilization or coding, you name it. Um, what we've seen is we've seen a lot of folks uh, who have had a lack of focus in their organization and whether it be because they just don't have people who have the experience or the educational levels, they need someone to come through and kind of sit in the seat and be a con constant uh, uh, a person and become a part of the organization to help their uh, revenue cycle move forward. 
And generally speaking, what we've started to do is we've started to take the roles of either a revenue cycle director or a business office manager in some of these organizations and help them go through and institute options within their revenue cycle to, to fix and to optimize and to make sure that the people are doing uh, what they need to do, but most importantly, they've got the tools to be able to do that. So what we all try to do is whenever we have an organization and they come to us and say, we've got all these issues, and they give us this laundry list, and if I talk to five or six different people in the organization, it's amazing, they all give me different lists of the things that are wrong with the organization. So what we always try to do is, and, and this is what I would encourage you always to do as well, whether you have that steering committee or you have those departmental revenue cycle meetings, start with an assessment. Move away from emotion and defensiveness and get to real facts, right? So take a look at the playing field and figure out what game you're actually playing. So take a look at the three, the three legs upon which the hospital is sitting on in your stool here, right? So take a look at charge master pricing and utilization, right? So the charge master being the menu of options, pricing being how we represent those out, and utilization being how we recognize those two things and put it out into the marketplace. Not enough attention gets placed on the foundational aspects. Most people end up focusing on the outcomes and don't end up and fix things. So what ends up happening as if the charge master or the way that we revenue recognize things, your system becomes sort of like Groundhog Day. Every single day you wake up and it's the same problems over and over and over again, and your team feels like they never make any progress. So the goal has to be is that you interrupt the process and fix things so that they don't ever reoccur. Whenever we look at things, and you really want to get a really solid assessment of where you are, we always suggest that you look at the emergency room, CT, and MRI. Why? Because emergency room is the funnel upon which almost all of the activity in your hospital kind of moves through. You've got respiratory coming through. You may have PT. You've got all this stuff coming in there. And if you've got issues in the emergency room in a chaotic environment, chances are you've got issues in other places. Likewise, CT, MRI, high price, high visible um, uh, ancillary services that are constantly under the pressure of potential patients leaking to other, op uh, other organizations. Take a look at those. You know, whenever we put these things together, and we also kind of also take a look at the operating room as well, because a lot of times when you were looking at things, what calls are coming into your organization? They're coming in to request quotes for services for that ophthalmology cataract case or the colonoscopy endoscopy services. Most hospitals don't actually know how they're quoting patients. They just know that they're seeing a continual decline in some of these services. When you look at it and you figure out what they're quoting, all of a sudden now it becomes obvious why patients are leaving because the quotes really aren't based on reality. They're sort of based on history. So we wanna make sure that we, we take a look and, and understand exactly what we're talking about. When we do these assessments, generally, before we start trying to, we will never bring somebody and put them in a seat or take on a, a long-term engagement until we can kind of define the parameters about really what the problems are. When we start taking a look at the assessment, what we want to try to do is understand uh, administrative command and control, what options are out there to be able to address the issues, and then monetize the fixes, right? So we had four very recent clients that went through sort of an assessment process, which was a very high level piece. And again, looking at charge master, pricing, utilization. So from an ER perspective, simple stuff in, in a lot of times from a pricing perspective, you can't believe the number of hospitals that have the majority of their emergency room prices set lower than what Medicare would reimburse a PPS hospital. And it doesn't matter if it's critical access or your PPS hospital, usually the results are very similar. So for one hospital, we fixed their pricing and we started looking at some of their uh, drug administration codes. They picked up 1.2 million just by taking some very simple actions. Likewise, we had a couple of other hospitals who looked at multiple modalities, specifically around uh, leakage that was happening out of uh, MRI and CT, and tried to take some of that very high level information, take action on it and monetize it, they ended up coming through with well over $3 million. So when, when you do these types of assessments and you do these, um, get these types of results, 
it does a tremendous amount for the morale of the people in your organization. Rather than feeling as though uh, you know, you're on a treadmill and you're running all of the time and not making any progress, all of a sudden they start to feel as though, well, wait a minute, maybe we've got a chance here, maybe we've got an opportunity to impact our future and put it in our hands. And you know, we always try to start with these things because I think that's really, uh, all of a sudden the confidence level of the organization really, really starts to, to grow. Okay? When, when we start looking at it and, and then kind of move things forward, so how, you know, I put in the slide here, how can we make a difference? But really is how is we collectively as the organization, how can we make a difference in the revenue cycle and impact uh, the, the, the process? So one of the things that's hugely important is in your organization, there needs to be a, a, a culture of administrative involvement, command and control. Every successful project has one thing in, in common with it, that we've got CEO and CFO who are firmly behind the initiative, see the value to the organization, and are, want to take the, the slings, the arrows, the blood, the sweat, the tears, to make sure that we're going to implement, we're gonna take action, and we're gonna be able to move forward. The most important piece, and it doesn't matter if there's a project or you're just trying to lead the organization to start revenue cycle meetings, Administrative command and control and involvement, huge. Likewise, departmental accountability and ownership. The years and the, the, the days of, of having the back end operations run the revenue cycle, you know, it's gone now. We need departmental leaders who are educated, who can take command and control of their businesses and have the ability to use all of the resources that are throughout the organization to maximize that customer experience and the results, right? So you have to ask yourself, are my departments in control or are they just kind of visitors on the bus? Are they just kind of being transported through or are they driving the bus? Very, very important. When you go through, are you looking at things that are systematic? Do you have the ability to, to almost teach your organization to fish? Are you putting a Band-Aid on it? Or are you saying, we're never gonna go back here again, we're hitting the reset button, and we're gonna make sure that all of the processes that we put in place are gonna stick, and we'll keep looking at them, and we'll keep moving forward. Very, very important. Last piece, and I put this as Stroud Water activity, but this could be any activity that you have for people that are outsourced or whatever. There's always gotta be a component of people that are helping you on the outside. And you need to make sure that you understand what they're doing, and you need to make sure that you're maximizing that value. Hugely, hugely important. Ultimately, the most important piece as we start moving forward in the revenue cycle is whenever we sit and talk with people, there's always this us versus them mentality. And the goal ultimately for you to make sure that you have an organization that thrives is to really get it so that we're a we organization. How do we make it so that everyone feels as though they are involved, have an impact, are empowered to be able to take the steps necessary to ensure maximum participation. And this is where a lot of the, the rubber hits the road, right? So this is where the administrative command and control and commitment really starts coming in because a lot of people don't want to do this stuff, right? Because change is hard, but the successful organizations who manage that change and stick to their guns, this is where we start moving towards the opportunity to thrive, which is really, really tough. So whenever we're in an organization and do any type of interim leadership and we're helping with charge master or pricing, our goal is always as part of the organization to be seen as a we, to work alongside folks, whether it's alongside administration. A partnership is hugely important. So the revenue cycle really needs to be seen as a collective and a partnership amongst all of the organizations with some people leading it, but making sure that everyone understands where we're needing to go. So. When, when we go through it, so what, what really makes administrative command and control important? So an engaged, informed administrative team, you know, is critical, right? So it, I go into some hospitals and they hire us to come through and do a full charge master pricing revenue cycle assessment, and we never see the CEO or CFO. They never come into the room. And as we're interviewing the department heads, they ask us, have you met the CFO? Have you seen him? And we say, no, they haven't been in yet. And they say, don't worry, they're not going to come. And then when they look at them and say, why do you say that? Well, this is like the ninth time we've done this. We're just going through the motions. So we take a step back and say, okay, so this isn't a good use of money for anybody. 
So administrative command and control and commitment is hugely important. When we go through and start helping administration, a lot of times they're not committed is because they're lacking data, they're lacking the informatics to really make the, the imp uh, intentional uh, process to move forward. And, and, and the perfect example is the stuff that Jonathan just described. You know, you make the decision to go to this sort of clinic designation. All of a sudden now, you may have to entirely change your charge master. You have to change the clearinghouse logic, uh, the billing processes of how your claims adjudicate and maybe split if you're doing provider-based. All of these things take a tremendous amount of time and understanding. And if they don't, then all of a sudden, all of that work that you've, you know, put through to do to make sure that you gain those, those possibilities, starts going by the wayside. So administration is hugely, hugely important. You have to ask yourself, do you have a mission statement around your revenue cycle teams? Why are they meeting? What's the purpose? What's the expectation that you've got from them? I can't tell you how many times we go into revenue cycle team meetings, and the only thing people don't talk about is revenue. They talk about everything else. But there's no expectation. So I'll always ask them, so what, do you, what reports do you get? We don't have reports. What data do you see? Well, our system is horrible at getting us data. So why are you meeting? Well, we were told we had to meet. Okay, but you don't have any expectations. So again, treadmill. So what's their enthusiasm about it? Not very high. So we need to make sure that administration has the ability to prioritize and identify opportunities and then engage people to act on them. And this is where you get away from, I've got a problem with my revenue cycle versus I have a problem with recognizing drug administration codes in observation in the ER. I've got pricing concerns and pre-authorization issues with MRI and CT. I've got inpatient coding issues surrounding my uh, assignment and, and understanding of identifying the complications which might allow me to get to a larger and higher DRG. All of these things start coming through, but if you're looking at all, you generally find nothing. When we start looking at specifics, all of a sudden we start making a difference. Very, very important. Once you've got administrative command and control, and this is where you look at it and you say, do we have that? The next thing you need to be able to do is really make it so that the departments have the ability to be accountable and own their process. That can only happen if administration sets the expectation of accountability and ownership. And they need to be able to provide the tools, the training, and the education to the department heads to be able to make sure that they can run their business. You know, we often get to the point where we say, can your departments have the proper level of empathy for patients when they mention that their husband just lost their job, my doctor just told me I have to have this MRI or CT, I don't think we can afford it because I've just lost my insurance, what do you think I should do? You know, so you take a step back, what is the tech going to do with that? This is where your hospital has the opportunity to not be in the business of healthcare, but actually be a provider of healthcare and instruct and empathize and help. Most hospitals don't have an answer to that question when that arises. What we need to make sure of is that from an administrative standpoint down to the departments, you've got them in a position to be able to take advantage of those things and help these people make the appropriate decisions and receive the care that they need to be um, that they, they need to receive. And it all starts, like we mentioned, it's got to be data focused, it's got to have quality at the center, and it's got to be looking at it through the customer's eyes. When you start doing that, that's where we start getting rid of the us versus them, or when we start getting onto the we, which is a very, very important step. And when you start seeing that in your organization, it, it's like a breath of fresh air that starts coming through. Very, very uh, fun to actually see when you start people see people being engaged in the process okay once you have the administrative commitment you've got the departmental pieces how do you then make it so that you don't have groundhog day all the time how do you allow the system which really likes the way it is today the change part of the system doesn't want to make the changes at all it wants to stay where it is it wants to stay rigid how do you implement and make sure that you allow the system to fix itself hit the reset button and not allow people to pull the, this is the way we've always done it here card, or you know, you know, the, all of those excuses that may come up, we have to eliminate those. So it's really important when we go through and you develop policies and procedures, you focus in on you know, registration and financial counseling, the things that you know, patients are upfront and touch, and how do we eliminate all of the potential errors 
that might go through the system and impact the final claim? What can we do to prevent things? How do we make it so that every time patients come through our organization, they go through the same steps. They understand exactly what's expected of them. You're consistent in your adjudication of those accounts. And people then look at it and have confidence of what you're doing and say, you know what, these guys know what they're doing. They're cooking with gas. I, I like this place. They're, they're, they give me the answers that I'm expecting and they're not pushing me off. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens only when you're able to go through and sustain the change and make sure that you're able to go through and understand where we may have gone awry in the past. When you go through, the last piece of it really is, you know, if you've got other folks that are helping, so a lot of times when we're in place and, and helping and being that revenue cycle director or that business office manager, and we're creating the revenue cycle teams and doing all the work, there's a whole bunch of time on the outside that we actually have to go through and adjudicate claims. We've got to go and push things uh, across, rebuild, uh, fix the charge master, fix the pricing, um, you know, impact the clearinghouse edits, you know, create the reports, that type of stuff. There are people in your organization that are doing those types of things now. Uh, do you know who they are? Um, you know, what kind of expectation do you have uh, for them? Uh, anybody that's doing any work for you in your revenue cycle needs to meet the same standards that you're, ex you're, you're setting throughout the expectation process of your revenue cycle coming from the C-suite down to the departments. Hugely important. And a lot of times those things are not even thought of. We're just kind of treating them as a vendor or treating them as, a, uh, as an extender of what we're doing, but we don't apply the same quality standards. And that's a mistake. You need to make sure that you do that, okay? So one of the things that, you know, when we went through recently and, and, and uh, had a project that was about a nine month or so project, uh, we, we had a process where every month we'd go through and identify all of the steps and all of the accomplishments. And we weren't really working on it from the perspective of identifying uh, a gross revenue impact. We really focused in on trying to identify the net cash impact. And that's a lot harder but that also stress tests the organization to make sure that the reporting and the activities can get down to that level so we can figure out cash. So whenever, any, whenever you start doing any of the internal processes that might have potential ROI, or you have people that are like us who are sitting in a seat and trying to help you manufacture an improved revenue cycle, really focus in on getting very specific. Get away from that all terminology and get to specifics. You know, if we're going to look at the OR and we impact this or we impact that, one of the pieces, though, as we looked at it, you know, we kept cumulative data because I think it's important to tell everybody what's and be very transparent about what you're doing. You know, for one organization, you know, we, we changed and impacted about nine and a half million dollars in gross and we calculated it was about four and a half million dollars in cash and that was over the six month period of time where we went through and did things. And it certainly wasn't all on us. This was a total we environment. This was people getting involved. This was administration. This was departments. And, and I think that's important because you need to be transparent in whatever process you're doing and, and make sure that the folks that are within all levels of your revenue cycle uh, understand their importance and their impact, you know, making sure that registration understands the importance of making sure that they make no mistakes in the registration process. Because those registration denials, hugely expensive, but also kind of tell the patient you don't know what you're doing, right? So very, very um, helpful to be very transparent. Um, the last thing I wanted to chat about and just kind of give a little bit more of a feedback on, so we had two, over the last two years, we had very two very uh, in-depth uh, revenue cycle director uh, positions that really took advantage of the entire you know, revenue cycle menu. So we impacted charge master and pricing and revenue capture and set expectations, put reporting in place. And one organization was initially losing $700,000 per month ongoing. And then after 10, 10 months, they were net $200,000 positive. And it was purely from going through and setting expectation, hitting the reset button, having a self-sustained model, and making it so that we weren't doing Groundhog Day all the time and revisiting things over and over and over again. Ultimately, over a nine-month period of time, through the efforts of that whole organization coming together, they realized six and, six and a quarter, three quarters million dollars in cash from the initiative. And I can't tell you, the morale change 
from the second month to the ninth month, it, it was an entirely different hospital. I mean, they were card carrying, remember, they drank the Kool-Aid, they saw it, they saw our future. And, and that is just, you know, that's why we all get into this, this game to try to do these things. The second client, a bigger hospital, you know, ultimately, you know, once we got through everything and we were there for 12 months, they were ultimately uh, over a period of 12, gained an additional million dollars moving forward. So it can be done. It is something that is absolutely up to you. And if you take the action and you take the process seriously, but move from uh, just uh, everything's wrong to being very specific, you've got the chance to really make an impact you know, on your organization. Um, Kimberly, you wanna take a second here and uh, just use our last polling question? Um, John, actually, we're just coming up at the top of the hour, which is all of the time we have. So just to be respectful of everyone, I thought we would ask um, Jeff if he wanted to add any closing remarks. Um, thank you, Kimberly. I, I would just like to um, uh, offer that if folks have questions, um, either now or later, that they want to forward, um, John and Jonathan are available to um, kind of help guide you or, or be a sounding board as you potentially look at each of these opportunities as a way to improve your organization's operating performance. The only other point I would make is we've got a second in the series of these webinars, which is going to focus on two different areas, one being um, staffing and productivity and how to put systems in place to monitor and improve efficiency. Um, and then secondly, um, approaches to looking at practice operations to the degree you have uh, aligned practices, employed providers, how do you uh, approach uh, enhancing the performance of those practices as two, two of your tools to improve operating performance going forward. Thank you, Kimberly. And thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you, and I will have materials, audio, and uh, presentation out to everyone tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for joining us.